What makes a party truly historic? Is it the amount of booze ingested? The volume of the music? The number of attendees? Do the cops have to show up at some point? Or the centurions, if we're going back far enough? Throughout history, the ways in which we rate parties may have changed dramatically, but the FOMO stands eternal. So? Today on Weird History, we're sneaking into the seven wildest parties in history. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, drop down to the comments and tell us what other superlative shindigs you want to hear about. All right, time to look back at some ragers through the ages. The ancient Egyptians held an infamous feast of drunkenness to honor their goddess Hathor, and these annual rituals could reportedly get quite rowdy. They would have mostly been downing a rudimentary version of beer, which was a staple beverage of everyday Egyptian life and less alcoholic than today's brews. To prepare their take on the drink, flatbreads were soaked in water until they fermented, and then dates or date syrup was added for sweetness, along with black cumin seeds, mastic, and myrrh for more earthy, complex flavors. They were probably also getting a little sand in there. Modern parties don't require much of an excuse other than it's the weekend or my parents are out of town but there was a religious and spiritual aspect to getting smashed during the feast. Hathor was among the most ancient and powerful of Egyptian deities, and her domains included not just intoxication, but music, sexuality, fertility, motherhood, and even precious golds and metals. It was a solid resume. In one myth, Ra the sun god, often considered the king of all the Egyptian gods, ordered Hathor to exterminate mankind for their lack of obedience. But even after Ra grew tired of all the extermination, Hathor refused to stop her rampage. So, as a trick, Ra prepared a massive amount of beer and dyed it with red ochre. Hathor, mistaking the beer for blood, drank an entire field of it, making her too drunk to keep up the massacre. So the annual festival honors Ra's duplicity and Hathor's intense drunkenness, which in turn spared humanity. Thus, the stated goal for attendees was to get as drunk as possible, which the Egyptians believed gave them special intimate access to Hathor herself and made her presence easier to perceive on Earth. Plus, it was fun. In 1828, populist candidate Andrew Jackson, a military hero known to his men as Old Hickory, easily defeated incumbent John Quincy Adams to win the U.S. presidency following an ugly campaign. Jackson was the first candidate to win the presidency who wasn't from Massachusetts or Virginia, and he was significantly more popular in the South and the West than in traditional American power centers on the Eastern Seaboard or Washington. Following his big win, Jackson took a three-week journey from Nashville to Washington and was greeted by large and enthusiastic crowds all along the way. This set the stage for his inauguration in March of 1829, which he declared would be an open house to which all Americans were invited. The enthusiasm for Jackson's election was so palpable, an estimated 20,000 revelers showed up at the White House to attend the inauguration. Though a crowd of that size obviously became difficult to corral, there are conflicting reports as to just how unruly the situation became, likely because of the political nature of the event. Washington insiders, already put off by what they considered the same rabble that had swept Jackson into office, described the scene as complete mayhem, with numerous servants shoved, spiked punch bowls spilled, and furniture overturned and destroyed. Still, others pointed out that the damage itself was largely trivial, and aside from the pushing and shoving, no serious reports of violence or injury were made. There's worse mayhem after the Super Bowl. Nonetheless, historians agree that things got a bit out of hand and the White House had not prepared for a crowd of that size. Eventually, bowls of punch and, by some reports, ice cream were distributed on the White House lawn in an effort to get the crowd to disperse. Wait, wouldn't free ice cream want to make people stay? Post-inauguration, Jackson requested $50,000 from Congress for a White House makeover before hosting his niece's wedding on the property. Some have suggested the entire inauguration blowout was a purposeful effort to trash the place, giving Jackson an excuse to get his new home remodeled. The historical records lack a smoking gun on these suspicions, but it sounds like something somebody would do. Presidents still have to answer to legislators and voters when they throw a true rager. But for warrior kings, the sky is the limit. Following an extended military campaign against the Persians, Alexander the Great finally conquered their capital city of Persepolis in 330 BCE. According to various accounts, while drunkenly celebrating the win with his mistress, Thais, 
Alexander mused upon the idea of burning the entire city to the ground. He gave the order, and his men, already pretty intoxicated by this point, started lighting torches and going to town. The festivities continued and musicians kept playing, even as the city burned. We assume we didn't start the fire was on the set list. Alexander later saved face by claiming that he burned Persepolis as revenge for Persian attacks on Athens. But it was quite possibly just the wine talking. French King Louis XIV's father used Versailles as a chateau and hunting lodge. But the monarch was so fond of the area, he transformed it into the grand palace it remains to this day. The first ever party thrown by King Louis at the palace was called Pleasures of the Enchanted Isle and went from May 7th to the 13th of 1664. Yeah, they partied for a full week. French aristocrats didn't have to go back to work on Mondays. Officially, the event was intended to honor King Louis's mother, Anne of Austria. But she wasn't even in attendance. The actual guest of honor was the king's mistress, Louise de la Verrière. And as you'd expect from a week-long party thrown by a king to impress his lady friend, it was an elaborate affair complete with floats, costumes, lantern-lit ballet performances, and horse races with a recreation of Apollo's chariot. There was even a huge model of Versailles that was lit up with fireworks. Smartly, unlike at President Jackson's shindig, the king kept the revelers from damaging the inside of his actual home. Très intelligent, Monsieur King. Louis was not the only infamous Versailles party planner. In fact, Queen Marie Antoinette's elaborate and costly get-togethers are sometimes credited with sparking the French Revolution. In particular, she favored masquerade balls, for which she would order elaborate and ornately decorated custom gowns. Stories about the Treasury's massive investment in these parties and their debauched nature helped to turn public sentiment against the royal family. Maybe cake would have helped. Extended multi-day parties like Louis' have largely gone out of favor today, but they were the preferred way of doing things among royals. In 1520, English monarch and general crazy person, King Henry VIII and his French counterpart, Francis I, held a series of meetings known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold, due to the costly canopies and furnishings that decorated and housed the event. The summits were held at Balingham in northern France, chosen strategically as an equidistant point between the king's holdings. They followed the signing of the Anglo-French Treaty of 1514 and were an attempt to solidify the bond of friendship between the countries. But in practice, England and France remained heated rivals, with the Hundred Years' War still a relatively recent memory. Thus, they were hoping to outdo and impress one another, and no expenses were spared. In all, the festivities ran for two and a half weeks and featured enormous temporary palaces constructed by an estimated 6,000 workers prior to the king's arrival. There were also reportedly fountains providing a constant stream of beer and wine. Wonder if you can still rent those. Some historical parties are so infamous, they've become legends. And there's no real way for us to verify what actually went down. Such is the case of the Banquet of Chestnuts, an alleged party thrown on October 31st, 1501, by Pope Alexander VI and his illegitimate son, Cardinal Cesare Borgia. Much of what we know about that party was reported by a priest named Johann Burkhardt, who wrote about it in a diary preserved by the Vatican's secret archive. Burkhardt's account was later viewed by 19th century historians, after Pope Leo XIII opened the archive. In other words, the sole account of the infamous party was taken from some guy's burn book. Burkhardt writes that Cesare Borgia threw the party in his residence at the Palazzo Apostolico, the actual papal palace within Vatican City. He claims attendees included a who's who of Catholic officials, Roman nobles, and around 50 sex workers. The name Chestnut Banquet referred to chestnuts being thrown on the floor for courtesans to pick up, but not with their hands. Other activities included a contest for whoever could be intimate with the most partners. There was presumably also a cake raffle. Though there's little doubt that some kind of social event happened at the Papal Palace on the date in question, historian Alexander Lee suggested that the word courtier, referring to anyone who attended royal court, was mistaken for courtesan, and the references to disrobing or nudity just meant people were taking off their outer robes to get more comfortable. Sure, sure, but how do you explain the chestnuts? On the other hand, Pope Alexander VI was not known for his commitment to celibacy. He's reported to have fathered the most illegitimate children of any pope in history. 
So the idea that his son threw him an elaborate sex party isn't necessarily that far-fetched. Another ambiguously wild party was thrown by English Admiral Edward Russell, the first Earl of Oxford, on Christmas Day in 1694. Admiral Russell was named First Lord of the Admiralty that year by King William, following a string of impressive victories in France. This great honor unfortunately required Russell to spend the Christmas season in Cadiz, Spain, rather than returning home. Disappointed that he would miss the holidays back in England, Russell held a legendary celebration in a grand orchard and garden belonging to Cadiz's governor. Most famously, the soiree featured an extraordinarily large punch bowl, essentially the size of a lake, containing an estimated 700 gallons of liquor serving drinks to an estimated 6,000 guests. The bowl was reportedly so vast, a young boy was able to ferry a rowboat with oars across the surface. Talk about a lazy river. Also, maybe don't drink the punch after that? Today, there are varying accounts of the punch bowl's size, along with the actual recipe for the drink, though most agree it was a combination of brandy, cognac, sugar, lemon juice, lime juice, sherry, nutmeg, wine, and water, plus a subtle hint of rowboat. So what do you think? Which of these parties would you want to crash? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.